Had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to the great wood for the day's abiding. Entering the great wood, he sat down at a balva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani. Dandapani was a uh, minor king with the in the Sakian clan. His, his kingdom was not very big. And he was very much attached to the Brahmin and he did not care for the Buddha at all. So he always was trying to find ways of uh, criticizing and that sort of thing. So Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to the great wood. And when he had entered the great wood, he went to the Bulva sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side leaning on his stick and ask the Blessed One, what does a recluse assert? What is, is, what does he proclaim? Now that it shows the disrespect. He thought that, uh, Dandapani thought that the Buddha should get up and greet him, but the Buddha was sitting and he continued sitting. So, Dandapani stood with his head above a teacher, which is a, sh a show of disrespect. I, I, can everybody hear me all right? Oh, okay, just making sure. Uh, so Dandapani stood and he leaned on a stick instead of showing res respect and ask this question. Then the Buddha said, I assert and proclaim such a teaching that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. In this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, such a teaching that perceptions no more underlie that Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving of, for any kind of being, when this was said, Dandapani the Sakyan shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. That means these lines here. Then he departed leaning on his stick. When it was evening, the Blessed One rose from his meditation and went to Negrota's Park, where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the monks what had taken place. Then a certain monk asked the Blessed One, but venerable sir, what is a teaching that the Blessed One asserts whereby one does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people. And venerable sir, how is it that perceptions no more underlie that brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. Monk, as to the source through which perceptions and notions 
tinged by mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing that is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the end of the underlying tendency to aversion, the end of the underlying tendency to craving, the end of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice and false speech. Here these evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. That's what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling because nobody asked him any questions. He always paused after giving a Dhamma talk and allowed space for people to ask questions. When nobody said anything, he thought, okay, you all understand, so we're just going to continue on, and I'm going to go go in and do whatever I need to do in my, my hut. So that lets you know that it's not good if you don't ask questions. You want to be asking questions at the end of the Dhamma talk to clear up anything that you're going through. It doesn't have to mean just meditation. Okay. Then soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding it without expounding the detailed meaning, excuse me. <clears throat> now, who will expound this to, in detail? Then they considered the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked, him the meaning of this. The thing is, um, in other suttas, any time Mahakachana was asked a question or gave a Dhamma talk, it was always the answer came back about the links of dependent origination. He really got into that very much. So these are the kind of answers that he would give so that you would understand the links of dependent origination in different ways. Then the monks went to the venerable Mahakachana, exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down to one side and told him what had taken place, adding, let the venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it is though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood after he had passed over the root and the trunk. So it is with you, venerable sirs, that you, th you think I should be asked about the meaning of this after you pass the blessed one by. 
when you were face to face with the Blessed One. For knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One, he is the sayer, proclaimer, elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning, as he told you so you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, Knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision. He is knowledge, he is the Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the sayer, proclaimer, and elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time that you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. So what we're seeing here is that during the time of the Buddha, he spent a lot of time answering questions. And people were not afraid to ask questions. Take that as your example of what to do. Okay. As he told us, so we should have remembered it. Yet the venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. The venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Mahakajana expound it to us without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Monks replied. The Venerable Mahakajana said this, Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, monks, as to the source through which mental perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome, and hold to it. This is the end of the underlying tendency to lust. The end of the underlying tendency to aversion. The end of the underlying tendency to craving. The end of the underlying tendency to views of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malice, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. I understand the detailed meaning of it to be as follows. Dependent on the eye and forms eye consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, there is eye feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. 
what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as the source perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation beset a man with respect to past future and present forms cognizable through the eye Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. Perceives means name. You, you have a sound happen Perception right then says that sound and I like it or dislike it depending on the quality of sound that you hear. So when we're talking about perception, we're talking about getting into the conceptual uh, way that we think. We only think in concepts. We never uh, are able to, con to express anything other than concepts. Uh, let's say you talk, want to talk about fear. What is fear? Fear is a concept. What is a concept? A concept is made up of many different parts put together to come up with the idea of fear. This is how we think. Continually in concepts. That's why it's best to, to work with your meditation until you get to the place where you can get into the quiet mind. As soon as you get into the quiet mind, all of a sudden, the conceptual things that we live with every day disappear. And there's a lot of relief not living in the conceptual world. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions, tinged by mental proliferation, be said a man, with respect to the past, future, and present sounds cognizable through the ear. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises with the meeting of the three. There is nose contact. With nose contact as condition, there is nose feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. Or, excuse me, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion tinged by mental proliferation. Beset a person with respect to past, future and present odors cognizable through the nose. When we talk about the mental proliferation, what you're mentally proliferated 
and according to the links of dependent origination. In Pali, they call it bhava. But I don't use that, that term very often because it's been interpreted in a lot of different ways that can get things confused. I call it mental proliferation. Now, it's real interesting because I've been with a lot of monks that are very learned. And I hear them talk with each other and they, they like to discuss bhava. And when I hear them discussing it, in my mind, I'm changing the word bhava into conceptual, uh, hab habitual, Whew. yeah, my mind just took a blank spot. So it's habitual tendency. Sometimes I call it habitual emotional tendencies. Now when I'm talking about that, I am talking about bhava. And what this is really talking about is getting caught up in your emotional states. Now, every time I listen to monks talk about their definition of bhava and that sort of thing, I change it to habitual tendency and habitual tendency works very well. So there's no problem with that. I went to Bhikkhu Bodhi and I told him that for practical purposes, when you're, when you're working with dependent origination, for practical purposes, it makes more sense to use habitual tendency than it does uh, existence or what's the other one that they use? Uh, mm -hmm. Being. It doesn't make any sense or very little sense. But he didn't agree with me. He said, no, that's not right because it's, it's not the using the complete definition of what bhava is. Bhava is uh, the physical, the jhanas and the arupa jhanas. That's what they're talking, what he's talking about. But when I use the term habitual tendency, that turns it into a more practical aspect of the teaching. And it's easier to understand that way. So when we're talking about habitual tendencies and how we get caught up in it, that's where our emotions come from. And that's old attachments to the way things used to be or the way things you want them to be. So It makes sense to understand completely what I'm talking about here. You have five aggregates, you have body, you have feeling. Feeling is not your emotion. Feeling is feeling. It's either a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, or a neutral feeling. Now, right after after feeling is perception. That's the part of the mind that names that feeling. It's pleasant, it's painful. Then you have formations. Now formations, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about your thoughts. 
you're thinking about and how you try to control a feeling with your thoughts. And the more you think about a feeling, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. The more mental proliferation there is. So it's quite a bit uh, easier to understand this way. When you're using the six R's, the second part of the six R's is what? The second R is release. Now, if you are caught in getting involved with your thinking and your emotional upsets, whatever they happen to be, you're not practicing the six R's. It's just that simple. You're getting involved with your thinking about and trying to control your feelings with your thoughts. And it doesn't work. You cause yourself immeasurable amounts of pain. So paying attention to the six R's is much more important than you realize how much pain you cause yourself because you get in a situation and you don't like it and you want to blame somebody else for your problems and think about them and how nasty they were and what they said and then what I said and all of this nonsense stuff. You're making a big deal that causes yourself more suffering. You're turning a minor thing into a major thing. The whole point of doing this meditation is so that you can develop your equanimity, your balance and not get caught up in your thinking about. The more you think about, the more difficult things become. So, what to do? Let it go. Don't get involved with it. Let it be there by itself, but don't keep your attention on it. Then relax. Put some lightness into your mind. Little tiny smile. Sometimes you don't feel like smiling at all, and that, that turns out to be funny. Well, I'm too serious for this. Are you really? So the more that you smile, the more you can laugh with yourself, the easier it is to let go of that pain. And your mind tends towards lightness and happiness. Then you bring that back to an object of meditation, which can be equanimity. It can be if you feel like you need compassion at the time, you can do compassion. You're in control of the different kinds of things that you can do for yourself. Find out which is the best way to go. Find out for yourself. Somebody else can come along and they can have an opinion and you hear it and you go, no, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't feel right. Then don't follow it. You follow your own intuition. 
And that's a big part of this practice following the intuition and letting go of emotional upsets. So your habitual tendency is about emo emotional upsets and how you try to control a feeling with your thoughts. It has never worked, but you get into the habit of doing it because that's kind of the way you were taught. So back off on that. Take a look at that. See how it really does work. And then change. A lot of people do Buddhism and they get caught in the first noble truth. Everything is suffering. Well, not everything is suffering. I, I was kind of raised by Buddhists that were Burmese and to them, everything is suffering. And from that perspective, yeah, it is. And there's no joy, there's no happiness. If you have joy arise, the first thing the teacher says to you is, don't get attached. Now, if you're like me, I didn't want to get attached. So I pushed the joy away. The only relief I'd had in years, I pushed it away because I didn't want to get attached to it. I didn't know what attachment was. I didn't know what craving was. Now there was a blank spot in the teaching that I was getting. And when I finally let that go and started reading the suttas and found out that the suttas told us to do some very definite different kinds of practice that help you to let go of your suffering. Then joy was not intimidating anymore. Joy was something to look forward to. And it's very important to develop as much joy as you can. Now, I told you the last time, I think it was, that there was a scientific evidence that smiling does affect your brain. And they, they did these experiments without using uh, words. They were just checking out what the muscles, the change of muscles, the configuration of the muscles in, in, your, uh, in your head when you smile. So they put a pencil and you had to smile. And then they measured what was happening in your brain and they saw that your mind tended towards being happy, having more joy. Over a period of time, that can change into a habit. And the more you, you develop this habit, the more life becomes interesting and fun. So if you don't want to smile all the time, fine. Just carry a pencil around in your mouth. Okay. So I wanted, to, I wanted to let you know about that definition of bhava that I used. 
it's not a complete definition, but it's a practical definition when you look at it on the physical plane. It makes it a little easier to understand how the links intertwine with each other. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is tongue contact. With tongue contact as condition, there is tongue feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. And it, it's a constant thing of trying to control your feeling with your thoughts. And you wind up fighting with yourself quite a bit. I spend a lot of time on retreats reminding people to be gentle with themselves. Stop being critical with yourself. Stop trying to force your mind to be the way you want it to be. Laugh with yourself. That you need to do a lot. The more you laugh, the less craving affects you. Give your laugh away. Give your happiness away. Give it to other people. That's the first part of meditation. Practicing your generosity in this way, very necessary part of the practice. So if you're walking down the street and you're smiling and you give that smile away, you are practicing your generosity. And if you can have them laugh that doesn't mean a full-on belly laugh, but just a chuckle. Then you're giving your happiness away. And it's necessary. How many times do you see people walking down the street, looking down and never smiling, always having a sour face? You see it a lot. When you're practicing smiling, your posture changes when you're walking and you tend to look up. And when you look up, you see people and you actually see them smile back. So they help remind you to continue. So they're practicing their generosity. It's a win-win situation, right? With what has one mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notion tends by mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, future and present. Uh, let's see, uh, taste cognizable through the tongue. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is body contact. With body contact as condition, there is body feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. 
what one craves that one thinks about what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates with what one is mentally proliferated as the source perceptions and notion tinged by me mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past future and present tangibles cognizable through the body dependent on mind and mind objects mind consciousness arises with the reading of the three there is mind contact with mind contact as condition there is mind feeling what one feels that one perceives what one perceives that one craves what one craves that one thinks about what one thinks about that one mentally proliferates with what one has mentally proliferated as the source perceptions and notion tends by mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past future and present mind objects cognizable through mind dependent oops uh, when there is the eye of form and eye consciousness it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye contact when there is the manifestation of eye contact it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye feeling when there is the manifestation of eye feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye craving. When there is a, uh, excuse me, when there is the manifestation of eye craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of habitual tendency. When there's a manifestation of habitual tendency, it is possible to point out the perceptions and notion tends, tended, ten, tinged by mental proliferation. When there is the ear of sounds and ear consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear contact. When there is a manifestation of ear contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear feeling. When there is the manifestation of ear feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of habitual tendency. Be set by perceptions and notions tinged by mental proliferation so you get a chance to see how this process works and how it everything gets tinged by your thoughts your opinions your beliefs and how you get caught up in your mental proliferation of that, of the emotions of that. Right now, if you walk down the street and you say something and somebody hears it and they don't like it, they, they're going to attack you. Or they can, which is pretty amazing. 
that they're so lost in their thinking. They're so lost in their emotional upsets that they aren't even acting like human beings anymore. They're acting like animals. And it's all because they don't understand how this process actually does work. And they're taking it all personally and they're actually getting caught up in those emotions and they will start to cause themselves more and more pain as time goes by. And this is not a maybe, this is a for real. So instead of fighting back with these people and arguing with these people, develop your compassion. See the suffering that they are experiencing. Let them have their own suffering and radiate loving kindness to them. Now it's pretty amazing when you start practicing loving kindness on a more regular basis. It is pretty amazing because you get more and more confidence in the power of the loving kindness. When you see somebody that's getting angry with somebody else, you can start radiating that person to, uh, to both of those people. And as you radiate loving kindness to them, they settle down. They stop talking with angry voices. They stop yelling at each other, as it were. And the more you can be an influence in that way, you are starting to affect the world around you in a positive way. It works. I've seen it happen way too many times to have any doubt that it works. And even a little thing of, I, I saw a boy that was, uh, he was very shy and he was afraid to make a mistake. And he was getting questioned by his parents for one thing or another, and he didn't want to answer. So as I started radiating loving kindness to him, I could see in his face that all of a sudden he lost a lot of tension. And then he just came out with the answer. And then they had a good discussion after that. I was radiating to the family, the whole family at the same time. And everybody was affected by that. It's really kind of magical when you remember to use it. When you remember not to get involved in your emotional upset because things aren't happening the way you think they should. Put your compassion and loving kindness into the situation, into the people around the situation and you will start affecting everybody in a positive way. And you'll see how magical it becomes. It's actually really good fun to do it. I recommend it highly. Nice way to spend your day. Excuse me. Ah. When there is uh, nose and odors, there is nose consciousness.
And it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. When there is the manifestation of nose contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. When there is a manifestation of nose feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, now the manifestation of craving, this is really important to understand. When craving manifests itself, you are taking whatever it is that's in your mind personally and you're owning it. Now, there's not a lot of equanimity in your, in your mind when you're doing that. There's not much balance because of your attachment to wanting to be right, wanting to be listened to, wanting to be in control. And the more you get caught up in that, the more suffering you experience for yourself. Okay? So it's real interesting when you, when you develop your mindfulness or ability to watch how things change, how they move from one thing to another. And what that does with your observation. If your mindfulness is strong, you'll be able to see that there is that mental proliferation that's happening. And it's impersonal. It's not yours. You'll be able to see that. And when you see it, you don't get caught by it. And when you don't get caught by it, your mind tends towards true balance and happiness. So I've been talking for quite a while. And I got told that I talked too long last last week. So I'm going to have to back off and talking more. But this is an important sutta to realize. So I'm going to go to the end of the sutta where they start talking about uh, this sutta in particular. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball. In the, in the course of eating, it would, he would find a sweet, delectable flavor so too, venerable sir, any able-bodied person in the course of scrutinizing with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable sir, what is the name of this discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember the, this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So there's a lot of lessons that are more subtle than 
you really consider when you're reading it on your own. You don't think about these kind of things. It takes some practice to do it. But you'll start seeing more and more the practical nature of the Buddha's teaching. And there has to be the willingness to change. Do not continue to do things in exactly the same way that causes suffering. That lets go of the pain that's there. Now, every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing a form of Nibbana. Ni means no, bana means fire. So no fire. And that's what the Buddha continually said over and over again. He called craving fire because it makes your mind hot and it makes your mind tight. And when you use the six R's, your mind becomes cool and more open. And there's more balance. There's a discourse that one monk, a Thai monk in uh, Thailand gave, he, he called it the, the cool nature of Nibbana. And it is cool. I thought it was kind of cute that he did that. Anyway, do you have any questions? Um, hi, Bhante. Oh, hi. Uh, actually, I today I read this sutta. Coincidentally, you are also reading the same sutta. I was having a question regarding the same sutta. Like in the sutta, uh, it says like, when there is no I, no farm, I know. Right, they're talking about the uh, Arupa Jhana nature. Okay. Okay, that, that explains it a lot easier than uh, trying to figure out what he's talking about with everything. The first part he's talking about just the physical, the uh, regular jhanas. But when he gets to this state, he's talking about the mental realms. Okay. The, yeah. Uh, I understand. Uh, like, does it mean that arahants won't create contact? They have contact. Okay. They're not affected by it. They have all the aggregates, but they don't have any craving. They don't have any clinging. They're not affected by it. They have perfect equanimity. And when you ask uh, an arahat a question, he's going to give you the answer through his in, uh, intuition. So it's going to be right. The advantage of being around an arahat. When you find one, let me know. <laughs> And uh, can you, uh, next question is, uh, can you, uh, like, all the seven factors of enlightenment are connected, you said, at one point of time. Yeah. Um, I see, like, uh, if, if there is a lot of investigation going on, the restlessness comes. And when I focus my attention on tranquility, 
it will becomes it will settle down yes can, can you explain other factors well one of them is energy whether you're using the correct amount of energy or not one of them is joy one of them is a still mind one of them is equanimity and all of these are affected by mindfulness so that's all seven see the thing is when you get these in perfect balance that's when you attain nibbana but you don't have to do it you don't have to get them in perfect balance as you keep using the six hours as you keep doing your meditation they will get in balance by themselves and then you'll attain nibbana this is one of the reasons that i say that this is a natural process because all of these things will happen on their own when you try to push and make them happen it doesn't work but when you allow the space for them to happen it does work and this is another another point that the buddha kept going over time and time again and that is letting go of the want to control and just backing off and not taking it personally but observing clearly how this process works that's why the second part of the six uh, r's is so important release don't keep your attention on any distraction let it be there by itself it's not important although our mind likes to try to make it important and that that's the cause of suffering so you have to be willing to be more and more relaxed and open with whatever arises there are some people that complain to me about how hard it is and it's actually not very hard it's pretty simple it can be tiresome because it keeps coming back over and over again well okay but you you have to continue on with your six hours until it fades away on its own see because the hindrances keep having or keep making uh the things arise that distract you they happen because you broke a precept in the past now it could have been a little precept it could have been a big precept it could have not meant much to you or it could have meant a lot to you and so that's that's really the nature of karma some karma is really small some is really big but what are you doing with that in the present moment that's the key when you're using the six hours then it doesn't matter whether it's big or small but you start seeing more and more clearly how this process actually affects your life and if you want to change things in your life you have to use the six hours much more often smile and practice your generosity keep your precepts it's magical when you watch it work and I, i really mean that it's quite it amazing works. uh i know by my experience it does work yeah so any other questions uh 
no bandha i don't have any other question now okay any... i think i have one question yeah um you talked a lot about intuition yeah. and sometimes intuition is like so weak or we couldn't hear it because like we are in the world that you know we <laughs> not really using it so can you please give us a little bit of um tips on how to improve that meditate more <laughs> <laughs> we get so caught up with a loud mind yes with a craving mind that i want it this way i want it that i have to do this i have to do that and you're distracting yourself all the time. So when intuition comes, it's a quiet little voice. If you don't pay attention to it, if you just kind of shuck it off and say, well, I'll, I'll think about that later, I'll do it later. Well, then the intuition isn't there to help you. So you have to take advantage of the intuition to be able to recognize it. That's why you do the meditation. So you can recognize the difference between the intuition and the overactive dukkha mind. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Bante, thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> you said something about um, wanting to be listened to as yeah. craving. Yeah. Uh, my only comment to that is, uh, as a father of two teenagers, wanting to be listened to is a constant <laughs> all day long. So it's a constant craving. Because I think maybe it's an opportunity to practice 6R, but it's just a lot of craving. I just wanted to mention that. Well, yeah, uh, there is the growing process, but that you can open up your communication a little bit more and tell them that they, they can have your time, they can talk with you. What they're really asking you to do almost 100% of the time is to love them. So when you talk with them, talk with equanimity and talk with loving kindness. And radiate some loving kindness to them while they're talking. And you'll see a change and, it, and you'll see the happiness becomes more uh, contagious. I'm almost afraid to use that word. <laughs> Thank you, Bante. Okay. Anybody else? Hi, Bonte. Hi. Am I too loud this week? Nope, everything is good. Okay, thank you. Um, Bonte, I have a lot going on uh, in my life. My mother is dying while well, she's in the hospital. Not dying, let's hope she comes home. My father also, they're in their 90s. And um, I've had a, a long and difficult experience in life. So sometimes when I sit down and I start the meditation and I am trying to generate a feeling, a memory of a happy time, and that feeling of joy, a, a happy time to, right. you know, sometimes I guess maybe I just need to wait longer right there until it comes up. Well, actually, I think you would be doing better to practice forgiveness meditation. Okay. Okay, and open your communication with your parents about things that have bothered you for a long time that they might have done that they didn't realize they did a, had a 
caused the problem. Talk with them about the things you used to fight with and that sort of thing and forgive them for not understanding. You'll get a lot of relief and the, the stress will start to back off when you do the forgiveness meditation. Now, if you need, write to David and he will send you a book on how to do forgiveness meditation. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, I will do that. And before you go in to see either one of them, I want you to spend maybe one minute realizing that their pain is theirs. It's not your pain. Allow them the space to have their own pain. But send them loving kindness the whole time you're with them. Okay? I'm not sure I will get to see them, but I will keep I will keep that in mind. Well, if you don't see them, but you talk to them on the phone, do the same thing in your mind before you talk to them. Okay. Okay. Great idea. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Everybody is so smart because I just gave this short discourse that you don't have any questions, huh? Hi, hi Bondi. Um, how are you? I'm good. Um, how are you? Good, thank you. I have a question. When you send meta or to a specific people at the end of your meditation or just separate, everybody has their own karma. Is it possible to get karma from other people or if if it is possible you how are can you getting shoot? karma as you develop having an uplifted mind a wholesome mind you get karma from doing that you don't take no, I mean avoiding karma oh okay so avoiding people's karma there is no way we can get people's karma if we send metta to them you're not going to get their, not, no, there's no getting their negative stuff. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, then let's share some merit. David? Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I hope you all have a wonderful week with lots of smiles. And give your smiles away to as many people as you can. Will do. Thank you, Bundy. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Bundy. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you.